Hello, Robert speaking. Hello? Oh. Hi. Hello. Hi, it's Robert. Hi, Robert. Yeah, I'm just plugging in because I'm down to, I've just realised I'm down to 6%. So yeah, no worries. I'm, no I'm, worries. I'm plugging you in. And, I've been doing the same thing this morning. I forgot to put my phone on charge last night. So it's, it's going to be one of those days where I can spend time just working near a charger and then working away ah. from it. Okay, thank you. Right, get myself sorted out. Right, there we are. All done. Good stuff. Well, sir, nice to meet your acquaintance. Like I said, my name's Andrew. Andrew Roberts. I'm one of the, uh, and I'm one of the, yes, yeah, one of the local congregation, a uh, member of the local congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. So thank you so much for your text, Robert. Yes, thank you. In in Morecambe, which is a little bit away, away from me, but uh, that's okay. Um, so where about for you then? Um, I'm on the south south coast, but I find that they don't answer the phone in the Kingdom Halls. Okay, well we're not we're not at the Kingdom Halls at the moment, right. so that will be probably the reason why. Yes. Okay. No problem. Um, well, it's it's a couple of things, really. Um, the resurrection. I would believe that Jesus rose in the same body he died in. Um, okay. Maybe it's best to just to deal with one thing at a time. The other thing will be governments. Your book says on page 33 of What Can the Bible Teach Us that, quote, all governments belong to Satan. And um, I feel that you would need to prove a statement like that. But maybe it would be best just to deal with one thing at a time. And I, I would believe that Jesus rose, you see, in the same body that he died in. Okay, the same physical body? Yes. Okay. What led you to that uh, conclusion? Okay. Well, um, I'll go to John chapter two, verse nineteen to twenty-two, if I might. Andrew. Yeah. Um, verse nineteen. Jesus answered and said to them, "Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up." Then the Jews said, "It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days." But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Notice body is a singular there, not a plural. Verse 22. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, that's the context, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. So he uses a figure of speech in verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews totally misunderstand him in verse 20, they think, they're speak, they, he, they think he's speaking about the temple in Jerusalem made out of bricks and stones. And verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body, singular, body is singular. So he's talking about his own physical body is going to die and he's going to rise up in that same physical body from, from the dead. And of course, verse 22 says that that's the context. When he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this to them. So the context is the resurrection. It was a spirit body or a physical body. Um, you know, where where do you where do you feel when he was raised? But where do you feel he was raised up to? But Jesus said that he's going to rise up in the same body that he died in. He's going to die in that body in John two nineteen. Uh, but he's going to raise that body from the grave in verse twenty one. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. The resurrection is central to the Christian faith. Um, you know, if a person were to deny the resurrection of Christ um, in some way, or misapply it in some way, then they're denying the centrality of the gospel. Okay, yeah, well, I completely agree the resurrection of Jesus is central to the Christian faith. It's what uh, the, the whole hope of Christians hinges upon, isn't it? Um, in fact, you know, Jesus many times raise that and with one who uh, in the first century didn't believe in the resurrection and he made it very clear that that was something that he believed in uh, and his disciples in the first century after he had died made it very clear that they believed that Jesus had died and was raised up back to heaven so um, so yeah no, I completely uh, agree with that um, and what about verse I, 21 I, what about verse 21 Andrew well, when you say you was talking about the temple of his body, yes. So I, I, I don't quite understand the significance necessarily of his physical body. Yes, uh, yes, that body raised up in his physical body. 
Yes, sorry, I, I interrupted you. I beg your pardon. No, 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 it's fine. I just, uh, I, I don't quite, I'm just trying to understand your, um, uh, your emphasis on the fact that it was his physical body. I, I don't have any um, kind of disagreement about the fact that Jesus was, was resurrected. Um, uh, as if you've read the Bible teach book, as you, you, uh, uh, you said in your text, then obviously you'll understand that we believe as Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus Christ was raised in spirit form and returned to heaven in spirit form. So, um, you know, you, you, you have an understanding of, of our uh, belief. But I'm just trying to understand what the significance is of it being his physical body, um, the, the kind of real importance of that aspect. Because if he doesn't rise in the same body he dies in, there's no resurrection. There, there is instead a recreation as a different creature, as a spirit creature. So Jesus, you would believe, is no longer human at the moment. He's now a spirit creature. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And you would believe in the, the same way that before before he came to the earth, he lived as a spirit creature. And the Bible says in one John chapter three verse two, "We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is." So I believe I read somewhere in your literature that the 144,000 are also not going to be human beings. They're going to be recreated as spirit creatures because they're going to be like Jesus, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Yeah, that would be correct. We, under we understand and we believe that the, you know, those who are selected to, to rule with Jesus in heaven would receive a resurrection as spirit creatures. That's, that's correct. So they're the only ones which are in the new covenant because the new covenant isn't for the great crowd. I've got my notes here. I remember reading that in the Watchtower for the 1st of April, 1979, page 31. So the great crowd have no covenant with God. But you're saying that the new covenant is actually made with people who are going to be angelic or angels or spirit creatures. It's not the new covenant isn't between Jesus. It's not made by Jesus Christ for humans. It's made by Jesus Christ for non-humans for people who were human but are now spirit creatures. Would that be correct? Uh, yeah, so, so the New Covenant, let me just get this in my head, uh, the New Covenant is something, is a covenant that Jesus made with his disciples, isn't it? his faithful disciples on the, on the evening of uh, the your, Passover. No, right. no, your book says the 144,000 are the only ones in yes. the New Covenant. It's, it's, it's a covenant that he instituted at that point yeah. um, and the Bible indicates that there will be 144,000 who are anointed by Holy Spirit to be members of that, that covenant so yeah, so we believe that the members of the, uh, of the 144,000 whom God selects anointed by Holy Spirit will receive a uh, heavenly reward then... um, but that's not to say that, that mm -hmm. faithful disciples, you know, Jesus indicated there would be another group who would receive an earthly reward. So. so Andrew, they're not going to be human. Your book says that your literature says they're not going to be human. In the eternal state, they're, they're actually going to be spirit creatures spirit like Jesus. Creatures. Yeah. So you believe the new covenant is not a covenant that Christ made with human beings. But it's actually made with spirit creatures who are like angels. Uh, well, I think you're, I, I don't think that's what I'm saying, is it? Uh, I think that the you know, he made it with humans. It's a it's a covenant that humans can enter into. But in the God. eternal state, but, they're but, not going to be human. But God can choose how they serve. So, um, in the same way that with Jesus Christ, he was a spirit creature. He came to earth, lived as a as a human, physical, uh, a mortal man, uh, and then was raised back to a spirit creature. The the 144,000, we believe the 144,000 are, are ones who are selected from mankind to rule in heaven as spirit creatures with Jesus. So when they're ruling in the eternal state, they're not going to be human. That's the only point I'm making. Okay. According to your literature. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, um, you didn't really comment on verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body because he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So he's saying he's going to dis he's going to raise up this temple in three days. Verse 21 says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. So I would assume 
from that that Jesus is predicting that he's going to die in his physical body and he's going to raise up that physical body you see three days later. Okay. Um, I think we uh, find that... Sorry, interrupted you, sorry. No, 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 no carry on, sorry. No, I, I, I jumped in, so you, you go ahead. Um, I think we find that. Don't Isn't that fulfilled? This is what I find so confusing in Luke chapter 24, verse 39. where Jesus says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, because obviously they bore the marks of crucifixion. And then to prove that he had risen from the grave, that he wasn't a spirit, he ate a piece of broiled fish, and, and my Bible says some honeycomb as well. So he says in verse 39, behold my hands and my feet, because they have the marks of crucifixion. He then says, it's I myself, handle me and see to prove that, you know, you can see these marks of crucifixion. And then he says in verse, the end of verse 39, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So he's saying that he's appearing before them in a body of flesh and bones. We believe that Jesus, you know, for it was raised as a spirit creature, uh, but was not able to materialise into a physical form um, for a period of time before he then ascended back to heaven. No, 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 no. Your literature does not say that. You said your literature is very clear. I, I went on JW.org the other day. I was there for hours. It says he manifested various fleshly bodies, which is a plural. That's why when I okay. read John two twenty one, I stress that it says body in the singular. Okay. But your literature, yeah. um, Insight on the Scriptures, Volume 1, uh, 785, 786, it says, However, for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples on different occasions in various fleshly bodies, I-E-S, bodies is a plural, just as the angels had appeared to men of ancient times. Like those angels, he had power to construct and to disintegrate those fleshly bodies, another plural, at will, for the purpose of proving visibly that he had been resurrected. So, no, your literature does not say he appeared in a body post-resurrection. It says he manifest, he rose up as a spirit creature, but then he manifested different fleshly bodies, it would have been eight or more, a different body for each, for each appearance. I'm, I'm happy, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities here, obviously you've got a, a number of references in front of you, um, but yes, the, essentially what I said is, is what we believe, you know, that Jesus was raised as a spirit creature and was uh, had materialised into a fleshly form. When he no, 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 you said a fleshly form, that's a singular. Your book says fleshly bodies plural okay so can i just ask, ask a question of you robert yeah what what is the you seem to be very focused on whether it's singular plural whether it's one body many bodies where does that where does that fit in what is the the significance of that to your faith well if you say that jesus rose as a spirit creature and then manifested at least eight or more fleshly bodies. That's nine fleshly bodies. That is not the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as predicted in John 2.21. He says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body in the singular. He's, he's surely saying, Andrew, he's going to rise up in one singular body, the body that he died in, a body of flesh. And a body of flesh that we clearly see talked about in Luke 39, Luke 24.39, handle me and see... For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Okay, okay. So, for your faith, how is, is that significant? Well, it proves that Christ rose, the resurrection, that Christ rose in the same body that he died in, which is okay. called a resurrection. Yes, yes. So that's what I believe. No, you don't. I mean, I, I... No, you, no, no, you don't. You believe that Christ rose as a spirit. He was recreated as a spirit creature. There was no resurrection. There was a recreation as a spirit creature. And then he manifested eight or more fleshly bodies post-resurrection. And like I say, and that, uh, 
my belief is that Jesus Christ, after he died as a human, was raised as a spirit, was able to... That's a non-human. Uh, That's a non-human, yes? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I was able to fortify his disciples by means of uh, appearing to them in a materialised form, and then uh, ascended to heaven as a spirit creature to be with his, to be with his father. So that's, that, is, that is my firm belief, that is my, and I'm strongly convinced of that fact. Um, now, I understand that you have a different take on that, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, you know, you're, you're totally entitled to that. I just, I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand. My, my, my position is the standard Christian position of the resurrection held by the Catholics, the Protestants and the Orthodox churches. I'm not Coco the Clown okay. with some strange belief. I believe what the Catholics, the Protestants, the G Greek and Russian Orthodox churches believe on the resurrection. It shouldn't be something that should puzzle you. It's the standard Christian doctrine of the resurrection. Christ died and, and rose up in the same body he died in. And, you know, that's, that's, that's absolutely fine. I think that's the, the thing. You know, that's why I'm trying to understand the significance for your faith, because... Um, that's the under I've explained to you the understanding that I have. You've clearly researched uh, in some depth yes, this yes. particular point. Yes. Um, I, and I'm, you know, I'm absolutely fine. I'm convinced of that for my personal study of the scriptures. Um, if you have a different understanding of that, you know, it's been interesting to hear your your reasoning on those. Um, and that's entirely your your entirely titled entitled to that, just as I. I'm entitled to, to uh, sure. my conclusion. I, I just That's why I was just trying to understand the significance of, of that specific point. Um, be, be, because Paul says at 1 Corinthians 15, round about verse 12 or 14, that if we deny the resurrection, our whole Christian faith is in vain. So it's important that we get this right. Now, did I hear you say that post-resurrection Christ is not a man? He rose as a spirit creature, so he's now a spirit creature. He's now no longer a man. Is that right? Uh, yeah, he was, he was resurrected as a, as a spirit being, yeah. And when he ascended into heaven, that was as a spirit being, not as a man. He's... Yes. Well, I've got, there are several passages written post-resurrection. One would be an epistle by Paul, 1 Timothy 2.5 where Paul, post-resurrection, about 30 years after the resurrection, calls Christ the man Christ Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, if Christ is, a, when Paul wrote this, about 30 years after the resurrection, in the late 50s, if Jesus Christ is a spirit creature, not a man, why does Paul call him the man Christ Jesus in 1 Timothy 2.5? But when Paul wrote this, you claim he's he's no longer a man. He's now a spirit creature. So why doesn't Paul say there's one God and one mediator between God and men, uh, the spirit creature, Christ Jesus, or the archangel, Christ Jesus, or something like, 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 like that? Isn't it misleading of Paul to call Christ a man if he's no longer a man? He stopped being a man 30 years previously, according to your literature. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say it's misleading. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's misleading at all. Is, um, so is Christ you know, I'm, a man? I'm when... Obviously, you know, I wasn't there. I don't know why the Apostle Paul chose to write in the, the particular Greek terms he used. Oh, I can tell um, you why. Paul uses the word anthropos, man, because Christ is a man. It's quite simple. There is one okay. God and one media between God and men. So when Paul wrote this, Christ was a man, the man Christ Jesus. That's what the text says. The text calls him Anthropos, man. Okay. I don't care what I what I think or what I feel. That's what the text says. Um, okay. So, so you're firmly convinced that Christ received a fleshly resurrection into a physical body, and 
that physical body went to heaven. Is that is that yes. how I understand yes. your your belief? Okay, yes. that's fine. Um, so so you're absolutely firmly convinced of that. That is not the way I understand the scriptures, and I'm firmly convinced in in my conviction. So there, you know, there are differences of a, of understanding. Uh, between us, and like I said before, you know, we all have our we all have a responsibility before God to be able to look into the scriptures, study the scriptures, and come to an understanding of what uh, the Bible's teachings are, and indeed, you know, what God expects of us to do with our lives based upon that. So, um, yeah, so that's what I feel that I have done. Um, Andrew, do you mind if I just read Acts 17.31? This is 15 years, roughly 15 years after Christ's resurrection. And again, um, Paul is... Um, not Paul, sorry. Luke here is recording what Paul said uh, in Athens. And Paul says that Christ is again... He, he calls him a man. It's Acts 17, verse 31... Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, raising him from the dead, the linguistic antecedent is man in the verse. So it's saying that Christ was risen from the dead as a man. And Acts 17 is about 15 years give or take a year or two, roughly 15 years after the resurrection, why is Paul referring to Christ as a man, if he really isn't a man anymore, if he's become a spirit creature? And not only that, the start of the verse is even, even more difficult, because it talks about the future judgment, which hasn't happened yet. Because he has appointed a day, that's going to be after Armageddon, in the eternal state, okay, on which he will judge the world in righteousness, by the man. Let's talk about Christ. So Christ as a man is going to, in the future, judge the world after Armageddon as a man. And it talks about Christ being risen from the dead, and the antecedent for that is man in the middle of verse 31. As a matter of interest, uh, Robert, when you, uh, when you read about God in the scriptures, um, does it assign God a kind of... Uh, kind of a gender pronoun. No, no, because God, because because God is God is spirit. Um, uh, well, yes, yes, and no. Um, um, I'd say no. Can, can I can I answer the question? Could I answer the question because it's quite a detailed question. Just just run just run the question through me again so I can answer it. Right, the answer is yes and no. Um, in in one sense, no, because God is spirit. He's not a he's not a he doesn't have um, physical body and physical sexual bits as we do. So the answer is no. God is spirit. John four twenty four, and and as spirit, he doesn't have gender. However, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each referred to by the masculine pronoun he rather than it. I can't think of any Bible verse. That, twice in the King James there's a mistake where it is used of the Holy Spirit, the pronoun it, but that's a mistake. Um, masculine pronouns are used uh, not to imply that um, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, uh, as in their deity, uh, have um, sexual bits as we do, but it's simply to imply male headship. That if you don't use he, you'd have to use it. And um, the Bible doesn't use it of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That would be my so, answer. So, okay, so if God is described with a with an agenda, you know, uh, if if we refer to He, we would think of a physical thing generally, wouldn't we? Um, so God is described in those terms in the Bible to help us to understand, like you said, relative position or position and therefore relative position to God. Um, this isn't implying gender in in Acts seventeen thirty one. It's saying that Christ rose as a man, as a human being, a male human being. Christ rose from the dead. Uh, he has given us assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And the antecedent is man. 
right? And at the start of the verse, because he has appointed a day after Armageddon on which he will judge the world in righteousness, how is God going to judge the world in righteousness? In the eternal state after Armageddon, he's going to do it by the man who he has ordained. So it's saying that Christ is existing. When Luke wrote this, Paul is saying that Christ was existing as a man at that time and in the eternal state after Armageddon, when everyone stands before Jesus Christ at the judgment, Christ is not going to be a spirit creature, he's going to be a man. Well, I, like I said, I... I uh, you don't base your faith on the Bible, think, do you? Your, your faith is based no, I, on books that you get, not on the Bible. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see that there is a, a, an issue describing a person who lives as a human being as you know, as, as the man that he, he was. Uh, I don't see that as a, um, necessarily a... It, it doesn't a, say a man he a, was. It doesn't say a man he was. You read that into the text to explain it away. You should make the text of the Bible preeminent. It doesn't matter what books you've got, whether they're Mormon books or Catholic books or Protestant books or whatever books you've got. The Bible should trump that. You should get your teaching from the Bible. And it says that Christ is a man 15 years after the resurrection, Acts 17, 31. He's a man. And 30 years after the resurrection, 1 Timothy 2, 5, he's called a man. And prophetically, in, in Matthew 26, it's referring to the second coming of Christ. So it's, it's a prophetic verse. 26, 64. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. The coming on the clouds of heaven is a reference to the second coming of Christ. Right? Okay. Now, it doesn't say you're going to see a spirit creature sitting on the right hand of God. It doesn't say, it doesn't even say son of God. Okay, it doesn't say son of God. It doesn't say spirit creature. It doesn't say angel. Who is going to come back at the second coming? It says son of man. And son of man is an idiomatic phrase meaning a human being. Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see, so that's a future tense, it's prophetic, you will see the Son of Man, a human being, sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Coming on the clouds of heaven refers to the second coming. So it's a human being that's coming back. That's why Son of Man is used. Not angel, not spirit creature. It doesn't even say Son of God. It says Son of Man to stress the humanity of Christ. Okay. Okay. Well, I understand that differently, but I think you probably uh, you could you probably explain it? Already. Could you explain oh, it to me? I could do so, the treat. Could, come so, on, you see it differently. Well, I mean, e explain it. Explain, Son of Man. Um, to, to be fair to me, Robert, uh, I, I think you sat there preparing very specifically uh, what you wish to say, and I've taken time out of my uh, my work today to to follow up on your request for contact. So, um, You've had two yeah, days I, to prepare. I, You've had two days to prepare. I wrote this in my diary, I think, two or three days ago. So you've had at least two days to prepare. When I speak to Jehovah's Witnesses, they just don't prepare. They're, Jehovah's Witnesses are just like Pentecostals now. All the time. The last conversation I, I, I had, I had another conversation this morning before you. And he's kept saying the same thing over again. I think, I feel, I feel, I think, I think. It's like speaking to a Pentecostal. Jehovah's Witnesses used to say, thus saith the Lord, and quote the Bible. That's what you used to do 30 years ago. But you don't now. You're just like the Pentecostals. It's all about, I think, I think, I feel, I feel, I feel, I think, I think. And you don't prepare because you assume everyone else is stupid. And um, no one understands the Bible except for you. So you don't even need to bother preparing. You haven't responded to anything that I've said, mate. Everything I've raised, you've just ignored it. And that's what the other Jehovah's Witnesses do in these conversations that I've had. Which, by the way, number 667, you, you should be pleased. You're not 666. You're 667. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I record them and stick them up on BitChute. Okay. So I think... Uh... You know, I think clearly this is uh, something that you 
wish to, uh, you know, pursue. I, I don't know whether you do this with other with people of other faiths. Um, um, you, when I can, it's yeah. very rare to get other people who will discuss the Bible. I've had a few chats with Mormons. I've gone through phone lists of oneness Pentecostals. That's a form of Pentecostalism, which 30 years ago I used to be involved with. 31 years ago, actually. Um, they're Pentecostals who deny the Trinity, such as United Pentecostal Church, Bible Way, True, True Jesus Church. I've gone through the mailing list and talked to those people, but it's very, very difficult to get a lot of these people to discuss the Bible. Um, I've tried talking to people involved in pro, pro-tithing pro churches that teach that you must pay a tithe to a pastor or a church. And again, I've tried speaking to these people, but it's very, very difficult to get them to, to dialogue. Um, I, w- I, was, I was listening to an Oxford University professor the other day, uh, Professor John Lennox, who's a professor of mathematics at Oxford. And he was explaining in an hour's talk why religion is really falling apart today and his explanation was that people are leaving churches in droves here in Europe and the United Kingdom because no one's giving them answers to questions and that's my experience no one has answers to questions it doesn't matter where you go Catholics Anglicans Baptists Mormons Jehovah's Witnesses happy clappy Pentecostals tambourine banging Pentecostals it doesn't matter where you go no one's got answers to questions And what ends up happening is people end up like giant hamsters on a giant hamster wheel. You've seen the hamster in its cage going on its wheel very, very quickly, doing a lot of work, expelling a lot of energy, but going absolutely nowhere. And so what you find is many people in many churches, they can attend church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And after that time, they don't know anything at all about their faith and they can't talk to other people. Because not only do they not know their own faith, they don't know other people's faiths. They're biblically illiterate. And people see this and people see that the the people who are biblically illiterate are the ones who go to church and they're just leaving in droves. No one's answering any questions. But anyway, thank you for talking to me, Andrew. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks for expressing your belief. Um, I would just like to make a, a, a point that Digital sense of recording of the call. Yeah. I would appreciate uh, you not publishing it anywhere and destroying any recordings that you have. I, I am going to put it on BitChute and it will be numbered 667 if you want to find it. Just just type Jehovah's Witnesses 667 and you'll find it. And um, so, you know, I would. I would I'm going to. to that, if you I don't like it, to... my name is Robert Skinner. I live in Plymouth. You can report me to the police if you're not happy. Interesting discussion. Um, okay. And you know, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.